Good morning and happy Sabbath. I am uh, very humbled and yet still very proud uh, to be with you today, uh, my church family. Um, proud to be here for my God, uh, but proud to be here for my students. I've got them up there and over there and over there and everywhere pretty much. Um, yes, so I'm very, very excited um, because of that. Uh, please pray with me before we, uh, before we start today. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much uh, for the victory that today is. Um, Lord, uh, just uh, help us to know and realize that your Holy Spirit is already here. Um, help us to have your will done in our lives today. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, if you looked at your bulletin, a uh, pretty neat sermon title maybe, huh? Uh, Zechariah Zygon should be up on the screen in a second. Um, we'll see if it, uh, if it shows up, and I'll get out my clicker. Well, it will be there momentarily. Um, I, uh, I brought my family with me today, uh, so if you see them after church, they're around. Um, I am 32 now, since the last time uh, we saw each other, I had a birthday, um, and so that, uh, that's a thing. 32 is my uh, favorite number, um, not only because it's my age, but uh, somehow most of my favorite sports players all were 32. Um, not all of them, but almost all, so I like 32. Seems like a decent number. Um, I don't know any different, um, right? So anyway, Zechariah Zygon, um, and, and that's not what it is, uh, but uh, I am a religion teacher, so what I do when I preach is I try to have elements of my talk uh, appropriate for all ages, um, even though I'm, I'm more uh, aiming at the teen uh, group on a regular basis. Um, so I, I throw in elements uh, for all age groups. And so what I would like to know is if there are uh, elementary students and high school students uh, that would be willing to just shout out, how many cubes do you see? No, none. How many cubes do you see? Two? Two? And I heard someone say three. What do you think, students? Two or three? I've got two up there. I see three up there. Okay, the correct answer is that there's three. At least three cubes. Oh, yeah, I know it. Okay, so why I chose that picture to start off today's talk is because a lot of times we are discussing God the Father and God the Son, um, and we do talk about the Holy Spirit, but sometimes he's more difficult to see in the different lessons as a prominent figure. So I'm seeking to, in this lesson today, uh, show the Holy Spirit as the central figure of the talk um, and give you a lesson from the Bible that would help you see him more clearly in your week ahead. Okay, So um, that's what's going on there. I'm going to test out the clicker and we're going to be right on our way. Um, last time I preached here, um, that is the way my daughter Denali, my eldest, looked like. Okay, That's actually the exact same picture I used um, in the sermon talk last time. If you see her now, she looks like that. Okay, and that's literally this week at the academy. Um, we'll have to replace some of Chaplain Seth's papers because we like to doodle. Um, we, generally speaking, like to play. Um, so she really likes going to parks, um, and so I accidentally found a park uh, with my wife once that had uh, that contraption, and I've got to tell you, that's one of the coolest things I've ever uh, been a part of, uh, because she loves swinging, but you're always there pushing her, right? Um, that actually let me sit on my own swing facing her, and as I made my momentum go, she's swinging with me, and that was, so she's just laughing hysterically the whole time that daddy swings too, right? So she talks now. Um, most of it is still baby jargon. Um, she's two, uh, but she does have some uh, conversations she does like this. Um, she said, daddy hat, and so we, we like wearing hats. And so she's, she's down the steps there um, in front of me, and what we had to do is we had to stand in the rain. But before we could stand in the rain, we had to wear our hat, okay? 
So this is, this is my, my daughter, Denali, and, and hats. Um, and then uh, what happens is she likes to eat. And I'm not sure if you can see it. Her eyes are basically crossed because we like us some noodles. right? If you put noodles out in front of her, usually they're gone pretty quick. There's a couple styles that maybe she doesn't do that with, but she really, really likes to eat noodles. Um, there's another one in my house. That last time I was here, that's how she looked. Uh, her name is Rainy. Um, and if you see her today, she looks like this. Um, she also likes to play. And that, that just looks like the front door of my house. That's really the cage we built to house her in. <laughs> right? Um, she also likes hats. Um, I feel like she's learning from, from sister, and she definitely likes to eat stuff. I've been looking for that cow for a while. Still haven't seen it. I feel like there's some evidence. Um, but this is them together, and they really do love each other. They get in some tough spots sometimes, but for the most part, they're just making each other laugh, enjoying the day together. Um, that is a shot from a uh, way, 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 way up in a hotel um, at Chicago during the teacher convention. I had a friend um, that this was the hotel they were staying at, and so um, they just sat by the window together and just looked out in awe um, at the scene that they, they, all the cars, the boats, the people. Um, and so it was a very, uh, another humbling moment for me uh, to see that because as I look at that, it's as if I'm, uh, they're looking out into the, what are they going to become? What does the future hold? And that's not so different uh, than the rest of us. And, and, and the truth be told, I have no idea what the future holds for myself tomorrow, uh, let alone those two babies. Um, but I serve a God who does, and that's good enough. I don't need to know because he does. Um, I will trust him with them. Um, they are his to begin with anyways. Um, they're on loan to me. So um, with that, I thought of, of, of kind of this verse. Yeah, there we go. Uh, the Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you, in his love. He will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. That's the plan. And there's a little hidden implication there with that word rebuke that he's expecting my children, they will learn to master difficulties. There are going to be moments where he has to speak up because maybe they're going too far one way or too far the other way, not to be mean to them, not because he wants them to, to hurt, but quite to the contrary, he doesn't want them to hurt. The plan is for them to, to live forever because of Jesus' sacrifice. And there is a system in place for them to grow up in his likeness so that they can be there in that day. It is, it is that Jesus died, but that is making it too simple. God has a much more intricate plan in place. That is definitely the price, but there are other players in this. And how I'm going to illustrate it is you guys accidentally played right into my hand. Um, right? The, the fall roundup, correct me if I'm wrong, was just last weekend. Right? So um, I, I relish the opportunity uh, that this is accidentally to be the bridge between fall roundup and your new pastor. I think it's very, very neat to be the bridge. I like bridges. So the fall roundups in the past, where the name of, of that activity comes from, uh, those were four to six weeks long, depending on how many ranches and the size of the ranches involved. And there was a serious amount of work to be done. Uh, you got up very early in the morning, and almost all of the work is done in the saddle. Okay. You covered states' worth of territory on horseback with a whole bunch of cows. Um, and, and what happens is before they ever started that, they met together as a community to discuss how it was going to go to select a captain. And he, had, he must absolutely be obeyed. And that's how they made it work back in the 1800s these fall roundups. So it is that you already have a captain, right? That's, that's the easy part. What, what I would like to know is, are you organized together? 
Or is your system in place? I understand Fall Roundup just happened, but are you organized as a team to do the work that needs to be done with the next 51 weeks before we meet together again for Fall Roundup? And, and I am a firm believer that even in heaven, there will be a Springtown Fall Roundup. The idea in these roundups was if people, and I know that there were tough spots because there's adversity, but the idea is if they could work together kindly and with respect, then it would go very well. And even when the emergencies hit, they would rise to meet those emergencies. So Jesus, the captain, laid down this law, love your neighbor as yourself. He goes so far as to say it's like the summary of the Ten Commandments, God's law of love. Love your neighbor. If you can just do that, you are fulfilling the law. Doesn't mean chuck out the ten, but that means that's the heart of the ten. That's the, the look on your face when you pop off the pillow. It, hopefully it's the look on your face when you, you lay it down to sleep. This is our attitude. This is our identity as Christians. Love your neighbor as yourself. Who is your neighbor? And Jesus responded with the Good Samaritan story. Uh, it, everybody is your neighbor. right? We don't have any pre-qualifications. Actually, I'm adding this in. Uh, this, this week, uh, I had that happen um, in a really crazy way. Um, you guys know Don Hill East Road out by the academy? I was coming back from a volleyball game, um, and I saw a car, and I swore I saw it stuck on the track. And my first thought is, how do you do that? Right, but then I, I, I realized there were other cars stopped, and I'm going stuck, maybe accident. What's going on? I asked my wife to stop the car, and she was like, "Really?" And I was like, "Yeah." Uh, and so I jump out, and sure enough, it is super stuck in the in the in the gravel. It's jackknifed, and it's on the track. Okay, so I um I, I I'm not really thinking really clearly. I'm just going, "Well, this is bad." Um, and there are there's other people there. There was an older gentleman. I've got the two guys that own the car, and I'm pretty sure a student from JBU because of the shirt he had on. Okay, and what happens is all of us together are thinking pretty quick um, because they're trying to see is there a train coming, what's going on, um, and and what we devise together is that the older man should drive the car, and then the four of us younger guys should try to push it because it's jackknife going down. Maybe we can rock it, and and somehow it'll catch and, and go to where there is it's more solid ground. Right, And so we tried and tried, and sure enough, it worked, and we all went our separate ways. Um, my home is about an eight-minute drive from there, and as I got out of my car, opened the door, my foot hit the ground, I heard a train whistle. It's a fantastic story, but he sends you opportunities like that every day. We need to have our eyes open to what the Holy Spirit's doing in our lives today. He's here now. He walks the halls of Ozark. He is present with us in our lives on a regular basis. So what happens as a religion teacher is if I just told the students everything they think they already know, they would be very bored. And understand very clearly, it is not my responsibility to entertain students. My belief is that if the Word of God is correctly presented, it is fascinating. So it is that when most folks study love your neighbor, I would wager that 99% of the time they're talking about Matthew, Mark, Luke, Galatians, or James. Without realizing, unless someone highlights it, it's actually Leviticus 19.18, all five of those places are quoting. And so that's why I put it in black, so that way if you, you know, if it's not highlighted, you couldn't have seen it. See what I did there? I'm corny like that. I know the type is small. It's small on, on purpose. Okay? Um, I, there was no way that I was going to be able to convey my idea here on two different slides. So as a Bible researcher, um, what I try to do is, is uh, read the Bible slowly, I tell my students, because if they read it too fast, they're going to miss things that are really important. Typically, they skip over the parts where it says, in blah, blah, year of such and such, 
And then the story. They go right to the story and skip the years. And what's really neat, and this is not meant to be uh, exact, I'm just trying to do a generalization here. Um, Jeremiah, way, way back when, in our little time bubble that we're living here, uh, he lives during three guys' reigns. Okay, And I'm really bad at pronouncing the names, so I just abbreviated it. And you see Kim and Chin beneath. Zedekiah, I can pronounce. Uh, he's the last one, uh, Zed. So he's, he's talking to all three of those guys. Well, what's really interesting is Daniel and his three buddies are taken away while Kim was just taken out. And then if you read Mordecai and you're going, well, you just jumped to Esther. Yes, I sure did. Right? My students are going, yep, he's doing this just like class. So Esther, right, is, is Mordecai. He's the Chin exile. So what's neat is that's, that's Kim's son, but he only reigns for a few months. So it doesn't take, Daniel's not in Babylon very long before a young Mordecai walks in. So even though I can't do it, I can't get Daniel to Esther, I can absolutely get Mordecai to Esther. He's kind of a prominent figure in that one. Right, just saying. Now, if you go to Ezekiel, he talks about his story starting in the fifth year after the Chen exile. So you have another contemporary, right? So I start teaching my students about when prophets show up. Most of them were before the exile because God wanted them to change their ways. Once the exile starts, you've got pretty much Daniel and Ezekiel, and they're encouraging them to repent of their sins so that we can go home because Jeremiah, and they had it, they had it already, has a prophecy that says we get to go home. You have a prophecy that says you get to go home. Is no different than that one. So what happens is then they get to go home, and they start talking about the first year of Cyrus, and it's very easy to skip that, or the second year of Darius. I don't really care because the Medo-Persian Empire had two ruler guys. Cyrus was Persian, and Darius is a Mede. Darius is the famous one that chucked our buddy Daniel in a, in a little hole with some kitties. Really big ones. <laughs> Right, so so and he's friends with Daniel. So you're if you're going, it's right at the front of their reigns that Daniel's still alive when Zerubbabel goes back to rebuild the altar in the temple. I'm gonna put money down. Zerubbabel knows who he is because Daniel's such a high-ranking official. Okay, so Zerubbabel goes back, and then while he's back trying to rebuild stuff, God sends now, because the exile's kind of ending, these post-exile prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, and they team up. It's so neat, and so if you're not studying it like this, maybe you don't realize when you're studying the books of the Bible that Haggai and Zechariah are friends. You get two prophets at the same time with similar ministries trying to encourage people to rebuild the temple, and they're there when it finishes. Okay, so Zechariah, our, our primary character of today, I couldn't just go there to him without you having this backdrop. And then uh, they claim it might be around 80 years between Zerubbabel and Nehemiah, so Esther gets tucked in there uh, somehow, some way, uh, her husband being uh, Xerxes, um, and, and that's the translation I'm using uses that. I know he has a different name um, in some older ones. Uh, but Ezra, I know, then goes to Jerusalem to help rebuild the wall and some other things in the seventh year of Artaxerxes, who is Xerxes' son. And then in the 20th year, 13 years later, Nehemiah shows up. And I know it didn't make it on the screen, but it's not long after that you have Malachi. And if you know what happens then, Malachi is just boom, done, and there's about a 400-year gap until you get to Jesus. So this rapid-fire sequence of these loving neighbors was designed for there to be this legacy in place when John the Baptist and Jesus start doing their thing in the future. And a lot of their prophecies, if you study the minor prophets, are talking about Jesus. It's a really, really cool study. So how did I get myself into this? Was Well, well when I was asked to preach, I didn't know what to do, but I had just uh, recently studied uh, Zechariah for this part of it for the first time. So I thought, there you go. Uh, but it's a little different when you're studying it for a devotional versus for a sermon. And I started, and so as we're going to go through this, I'm just going to start showing you what my thoughts were as I went. And I had some good guesses that turned out to be right, and then I had some surprises that really were fascinating uh, to me. Uh, but you see all these loving neighbors? Um, I, I couldn't help it. I just This leads you to only one logical conclusion after seeing so many loving neighbors. 
Um, it's such a nice neighborhood of names, would you agree? So I have to ask, won't you be my neighbor? <laughs> and yes, though I'm 32, I actually grew up on his ending season. So I am, um, you can ask my students, I have done a worship talk on Fred Rogers. I'm an I'm a absolutely huge fan. Um, so Zechariah 4, 1 through 6, presents you with this picture. Uh, this is the vision that he has, um, and I would guess that Zechariah doesn't get talked about frequently as the primary topic of, of sermons. Um, and so I looked at this, and I was like, wow, how am I going to explain this, um, and, and what am I going to do with it? But when I was first learning it, I was totally confused. So what, what this is, is, and we'll read it still, there are two olive trees, and then there is a little golden tube from the branches going to a bowl. Can you see the golden bowl? And the, so the oil goes from those tubes into the bowl, and then there are other ones that are much harder to see. I, I took a while to look at it, even when I was close to my computer screen. Um, there are other ones in the back behind the lampstand connecting those, those flames or the candles to the bowl. So the, there's oil going into the bowl and then from the bowl to those candles, and there are seven of them on this golden candlestick. So here's the text itself. Then the angel who talked with me returned and woke me up like someone awakened from sleep. He asked me, what do you see? I answered, I see a solid gold lampstand with a bowl at the top and seven lamps on it with seven channels to the lamps. Also, there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on the left. I asked the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? He answered, uh, do you not know what these are? And he's like, no, my Lord. I replied, he's the same answer. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. So now we know who we're talking to. Uh, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. And that statement, that's verse 6. 4 verse 6 um, is, was, is the key text for today. It applies to every part of our life. It is not by human understanding. It is not by human strength that we get through today. It is by the Holy Spirit. It's through what Jesus teaches us, and His Holy Spirit then makes alive in us, and we choose to be that, that we move forward in our walk with God, and we become uh, more Christ-like. That's the plan. Every day, even in heaven, the plan is to become more and more Christ-like, learn more and more about God. It's going to always be going deeper. Uh, the God doesn't change, but your magnifying glass on him does. When students use a microscope in science class, the world looks completely different, but it's the same world. Same thing happens in my world where I like using telescopes. You point it at the sky and you realize there's a whole lot more stars up there than you think. And then you remember Abraham was asked to try to count them. Go ahead. That's how many descendants you're going to have. And then you use a telescope and realize there's even more. So there's a clue. And I jump to 11 to 14. Then I asked the angel, what are these two olive trees on the right and the left of the, of the lampstand in the backdrop? Again, I asked him, what are these two olive branches beside the two gold pipes that pour out golden oil? He replied, do you not know what these are? No, my Lord, I said. So he said, these are the two who are anointed to serve the Lord of all the earth. Now, we know that anointing services have to do with oil, uh, but what got my attention was the word anointed itself, uh, because that's never used lightly in the Bible. And it's actually all over the Bible, way more frequently than most people will realize. You even say it all the time. Uh, uh, in Greek, it gets switched around into English a little bit, but it's the word Christ. When you switch it over to Hebrew, it's the word Messiah. And if you just straight up say it in English, it's Jesus the Anointed One. So when you say Jesus Christ, you just said Jesus the Anointed One. When you say Jesus the Messiah, you just said Jesus the Anointed One. Okay? Notice the word I'm saying, Anointed One. So then what's going on with two? And I just, my brain went straight to one place and I'm really grateful that that's exactly what it is, and I'll keep explaining it as we go. Uh, two olive trees with the clue, what are they? Golden bowl, what was that? Oil, what is that? Golden lampstand, what is that? We're going to hit every single one of those so that you will leave church today being able to look at a picture like that and knowing exactly what it means. Okay, This is, this is what I try to do when I work for the students. So my brain went here. 
I, I in my head went, there are two angels on either side of the Ark of the Covenant, and that the, the Shekinah glory, when that was really in the most holy place in the sanctuary, uh, is the manifestation of God's glory, and there's two angels on either side. And then I felt like I had seen this somewhere before, and I went, I feel like it was Springtown. I have no idea why I think that, and so I went back to my old presentation that I did the last time I spoke here, and sure enough, that's where I saw it. So some artist out there, whether on, on accident or maybe they did some research, I have no idea why they did it this way, but there are two angels on either side of Jesus coming in the clouds. Okay, so what happens then is then it dawns on me that if we're talking heavenly messengers, angels are always helping out humanity, even those two. So the golden bowl, I thought, that's got to be us. Okay, and I do have a source that's going to back me up, and we're going to get there. And, and this was our flag uh, day that was just this week, and, and I was very impressed. This, this particular one about the golden bowl, they use like golden colors in there. This is the freshman class, right? 2022, that just, so many twos, um, right? Uh, but they put our time to shine. And that is exactly what the sermon is about. And they didn't even know I was up to it. Um, the oil, okay, so now I'm not so sure about that, but I had an idea. I know a Bible verse that I feel like gives me a clue, and that's a little bit more of a modern adaptation to it. I'm totally okay with that. But when you read it, it says, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. So your word is the lamp, and it dawned on me what era we're talking about back here with David. Um, And you've got lamps that are maybe something like that. They run on oil. So if the word of God is the lamp, what's the oil that makes it go? It's got to be the Holy Spirit. There's the lampstand then. If it's coming from angels going to an individual and going from the individual and it's still the same golden oil represented by the Holy Spirit, it has got to be going out to other people. And that's you. That's you taking it to other people, right? We come here. Isn't this what we say we believe? We say that if, if we prepare and we pray and God helps the preachers preach to us and we learn what the preacher is trying to say and then we take it with us that week, the hope is that it wouldn't just change us but that we go help change somebody else's life and bring them closer to Christ so that we can come back here to Springtown again next week and do it again. That's the plan. And we'll keep doing it until he comes back. So this is my, my source, the beginning of it. I have more than one. Review and Herald, March 2, 1897. And so I already had the thoughts. I wondered if I could find something in one of those articles that sounded like it. And I, and I started to find this. From the two olive trees, the golden oil was emptied through golden pipes. Uh, and into the bowl of the candlestick and thence into the guard, or not guard, golden lamps that gave light to the sanctuary. So from the holy ones that stand in God's presence, his spirit is imparted to human instrumentalities. So I'm underlining the parts that connect to what we already talked about, who are consecrated to his service. The mission of the two anointed ones is to communicate light and power to God's people. It is to receive blessing for us that they stand in God's presence. As the olive trees empty themselves, into the golden pipes so the heavenly messengers seek to communicate all that they receive from God. They seek to communicate. So it is not just passive communication. We have that in interpersonal communicate oh man, interpersonal communication classes in college will teach you about being real intentional or passive. This is intentional. They are seeking to help us every single day with diligence. So the whole heavenly treasure awaits our demand and reception, and as we receive the blessing, we in our turn are to impart it. Thus it is that the holy lamps are fed, and the church becomes a light bearer in the world. See, you can do it now, huh? What once was strange looking, now you can look at it, and if you ever see some other depiction of it, you will know what's going on. 
And my hope is that you will see the center focus on the Holy Spirit and his role in our lives and how it's connected uh, directly 100% to Jesus. So in summary, again, uh, in case you, anybody's taking notes, um, my students always take notes, so this is how I do things. Two angels, you have the believer or believers, uh, the Holy Spirit and the church working together as one system to provide light for anybody who passes by. I suddenly am a huge fan of Zechariah. Right? Why didn't I read this sooner? Is how I felt. Um, and I did. Uh, this is that's where I started with four. I'm kind of wondering what the rest of the book has. If you know what I'm saying, um, the Holy Spirit is continually communicating with this church. So why does it matter to me? I have recorded part of an actual conversation, okay, with me and a student just this last week or two. Um, and so here it is. Tim's to student. You struggle with why I believe in you students more than that I believe in my students, don't you? The reply came, yes, because I know you believe. It's not always clear why, of course. And my heart sank. So this is what I said. I know what Jesus is capable of to change a life, no matter the healing or perspectives needed. I am persuaded that he is able. I need no other reason to believe in his child. The student reply. Interestingly, I've never heard it put quite that way before. That or I haven't been paying attention. And then I, for whatever reason, I started thinking again. And I went, that really worries me because we as a church sometimes teach about this. How there were five wise and five foolish. And then it hit me like a brick wall. Here I am preparing a sermon talk about the oil and Zechariah. I wonder if I can find anything that connects it to this parable. And I sure did. So, really quickly... At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them, right? The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and that's how it feels, not reality, but that is how it feels. And they all became drowsy and fell asleep. All of them did. Then at midnight, the cry rang out. Now we're in an emergency. Here, the, he's come. Bridegroom's coming. Come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish one said to the wise, give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied. They may not be enough for both us and you. And, and by the way, they couldn't give it to them because it was already in their lamps. You can't transfer character, folks. You can't transfer character. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. Do you know how I accidentally found this? I had another student who had asked me a question weeks ago um, about their life and situation, and I thought long and hard, and I couldn't think of anything. And then as I'm doing the research, I accidentally stumbled on this chapter, Christ Object Lessons 20. And I told them, you need to read this because it's answering the question you asked me. And they did. And I don't have it listed here, but they texted me this thing text that came up on here. And I was so stoked and excited to be here today because of that student in my heart and in my mind saying the things that they said, that, that I, I have got to be in this part of my Bible more. I'm going to keep reading. I'm going to, keep, I'm going to look at other object lessons in this book to help get me into my Bible. Very, very proud of them. So here's, i I got to confess, I, I usually try to keep my quotes very short. I have carved this thing up, and it is still the longest quote I have ever done in my entire life in a sermon. So if you can bear with me and, and, and stick with it, I really think this will be meaningful to you. Why? Because it was meaningful to that student. 
The two classes of watchers represent the two classes who profess to be waiting for their Lord. They are called virgins because they they profess a pure faith. By the lamps is represented the word of God. So now we have the same thing going on. Even Psalm 119, 105 is cited. Then the most crazy thing happened. The very next thing is the oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit and Zechariah 4 is cited. All of the different verses, all at home in the one spot, and it's connected to this part of Matthew 25. Oh, I was giddy, so now you can see why I kept typing. Uh, From the two olive trees, the golden oil was emptied. So now the exact same quote I shared with you before until the wording changes here, and I don't know why. It's just, it does. The mission of the two anointed ones is to communicate to God's people that heavenly grace, which alone can make his word a lamp to the feet and a light to the path. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts, Zechariah 4.6. In the parable, all ten virgins went out to meet the bridegroom. All had lamps and vessels for oil. For a time there was seen no difference between them. So with the church that lives just before Christ's second coming, all have a knowledge of the scriptures, All have heard the message of Christ's near approach and confidently expect his appearing. But as in the parable, so it is now, a time of waiting intervenes. Faith is tried. And when the cry is heard, and the quote's repeated, many are unready. They have no oil in their vessels with their lamps. They are destitute of the Holy Spirit. Without the Spirit of God, a knowledge of his word is of no avail. The theory of truth unaccompanied by the Holy Spirit cannot quicken the soul or sanctify the heart. And sanctify, that means to become more Christ-like. It also means to be set apart for a special purpose. We, by becoming more Christ-like, are we not being set apart for a special purpose? There is a banquet table in heaven that has a seat with your name on it. There is a crown in heaven unique to you with your name on it. There is a mansion in heaven unique to you with your name on it. Heaven only makes sense to me with you in it. I need you guys to be there. Choose to be there. The price has already been paid. You just have to walk there with me. One may be familiar with the commands and promises in the Bible, but unless the Spirit of God sets the truth home, the character will not be transformed. Without the enlightenment of the Spirit, men will not be able to distinguish truth from error, and they will fall under the masterful temptations of Satan. The class represented by the foolish virgins are not hypocrites. They have a regard for the truth. They have advocated for the truth. They are attracted to those who believe the truth. But they have not yielded themselves to the Holy Spirit's working. They have not fallen upon the rock, Christ Jesus, and permitted their old nature to be broken up. This is not a statement of depression, church. This is a statement of change. Become more Christ-like while there's still time. And there is time today for us to go help others. And in helping others, it helps us. It's really a neat system that Jesus has put in place. We cannot keep Christ apart from our lives here and yet be fitted for his companionship there in heaven. In the parable, the wise virgins had oil in their vessels with their lamps. Their light burned with undimmed flame through the night of watching. It helped to swell the illumination for the bridegroom's honor. That's what we're to do today. Swell it up before he comes. I know it's going to get dark. So does this quote. Shining out in the darkness, it helped to illuminate the way to the home of the bridegroom, to the marriage feast at midnight implied. So the followers of Christ are to shed light into the darkness of the world at midnight. Through the Holy Spirit, God's word is a light as it becomes a transforming power in the life of the receiver. By implanting in their hearts the principles of his word, check that out, the principles of his word in the heart, is God's plan in your life today. I tell my students, it's your identity raised to Christ. That's what God is thinking. Okay, You don't have to have all your questions answered. I serve a God who has the answers, and he says, if I can't understand it right now, he'll explain it to me later. He needs me to trust him right now. The light of his glory, his character, right? is to shine forth in his followers. Thus they are to glorify God, to lighten the path to the bridegroom's home, to the city of God, to the marriage supper of the Lamb. 
The light of the sun of righteousness is to shine forth in good works, in words in, of truth, and deeds of holiness. Thus, in the night of spiritual darkness, God's glory is to shine forth through his church in lifting up the bowed down and comforting those that mourn. If you didn't feel like you had a purpose or direction in church today, I'm hoping you have one now. She references it again. Church, I swear to you, I did not know this chapter existed when I started writing this sermon. It is the love of God continually transferred to man that enables him to impart light into the hearts of all who are united to God by faith. The golden oil of love flows freely to shine out again in good works in real heartfelt service for God. And as I read that, I felt like it just says Springtown. Because I've been here a long time in the past and a long time now, and I have seen consistently heartfelt service for God. I come here and I feel safe from the second my foot hits the pavement till I leave to go home. In the great and measureless gift of the Holy Spirit, are contained all of heaven's resources. It is not because of any restriction on the part of God that the riches of his grace do not flow earthward to men. If all were willing to receive, all would become filled with his spirit. There is nothing that Christ desires so much as agents who will represent to the world his spirit and character. There is nothing that the world needs so much as the manifestation through humanity of the Savior's love. All heaven is waiting for channels through which can be poured the holy oil to be a joy and blessing to human hearts. you should not ever be able to look at that again in the store and not think of the Holy Spirit. I don't care what brand you buy. It still works. Right? I, I honestly, I never cared about the oil in the store anymore, but when I look there now, I'm going to try to remember what Jesus has done for me and what the Holy Spirit is still doing with him, with us. Hmm. Yeah. So remember when I said I wasn't sure what I was doing? So I really didn't. When, when I found all that, I'm like, okay, okay what, what do you do for a sermon title now? Right? So I started, I, this is what I did. I'm telling you the truth. I went out to Google and I was like, cool Z words, enter. And I was like, maybe I will find something I can pronounce that might somehow loosely fit. And I, and I accidentally ran into this. So what I actually found was not Zygon. I, I, I found something I knew, so I went with that. If you guys just touch your, your face about the cheekbone, I've got something for you to take home with you. You can't even get rid of it because it's already in you. Right? Yeah, somebody just said it. The zygomatic arch I knew was the cheekbone, so I went there, and I went, why on earth do they call it that? So I went researching, and it comes from a word that comes from a word, and the Greek is zygon, and zygon means that, not the cows, the yoke. The word means yoke, and I dropped my jaw. I found a Z word that means yoke in a lesson like this. Oh, I'm so going there, right? I started with the, I started with the roundup, and I've got something that's put on cows, right? And you just had the fall roundup. It's, this is Zechariah Zygon the whole way. So what happens is if you don't know how it works, when you flip the skull up like that, you see those two hoops. That's how it works. See if I go back one? See the hoops? See the hoops? So somebody way back when saw that and went, hey, it's a yoke. <laughs> so that's where it comes from. So remember, uh, this is what's going to happen, is in the Bible, uh, Jesus wants to, us to put his yoke on. And, and you don't just put a yoke on one cow, typically. It's usually, we, we've got teamwork going on here, right? So it's even in our faces, right? To remind us that our faces have a work to do. Your face is a missionary to someone else's face. So when then my students are like, I'm struggling seeing Jesus, I try to remind them to look at each other. Because when they're clicking on all cylinders, it's very easy for me to see God. And in fact, at this point in my life, I think it's harder to not see him. His kids walk into my room every day. And they're all different. All wonderful and beautiful in so many 
unexplainable ways. Oh, sure, they're ornery too. That's part of it, right? And I love that part too. Your sphere of influence is whoever sees your face. Biblically, it said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Usually that section is quoted about peace and rest. I want you to look at the yoke. The yoke is the Ten Commandments, according to Desire of Ages 3.29. The yoke is an instrument of service. The oxen need it to labor effectively. Watch this. Can you see the farmer trying to do his work with unyoked oxen? That's not going to end well. Because the oxen are not going to do the same thing at the same time. They have to be yoked together in order to labor effectively. We need it too. Our will must be bound to his will. So as we go on, love for God and zeal for his glory. Love for fallen humanity is what brought Jesus to earth to suffer and to die. It's that controlling power of his life, this principle that he bids us adopt. How do you do it is right here in 6.8. He has shown you, or mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Luke puts it this way. And by the way, this is my continual message to my students. Uh, they, They really like doing kindnesses to people who already love them. But the message of the Holy Spirit today is to you who are listening in Springtown, love your enemies Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those uh, from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. Uh, But but we even had a demonstration here. Take what you need and please remember to put something in the... What was the trust? That's not like the world does it. But love your enemies, it says, even so. Do good to them and lend to even them without expecting it back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because He is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. That's what He does every day. He doesn't wait for anybody to be kind to Him back. He just keeps being kind. There's the message for the church today. Just keep being kind. Keep your eyes wide open. I don't care if it's in the supermarket, somebody bag dropped. I don't care if it's somebody broken down the side of the road. I don't care if a neighbor has got their field on fire, but yours isn't. Do whatever it takes to do that. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Talk as Christ talked. Work as he worked. Catching sight of his loveliness, we long to practice the virtues and righteousness of Christ. It is by beholding Christ that we become changed into his image and by renouncing our self, selfishness, giving our hearts up wholly to Jesus for his spirit to refine, ennoble, and elevate, we will be in close connection with the future world, bathed in the bright beams of the Son of Righteousness. My daughter runs a ho- around the house saying, that, uh, Daddy, sunshine? She points at it coming through the windows. Sunshine? And I look at her and I say, Denali is Daddy's sunshine. She points at sister, Rainy sunshine? I said, yes, Rainy is my sunshine too. Uh, on a similar note, she says this, Rainy, uh, pr- pretty, pretty, Rainy? I said, yes, pretty, pretty, Rainy. She said, pretty, pretty, Denali. And I said, yes, pretty, pretty Denali. She points at me and says, pretty, pretty daddy. And I said, um, um, no, no, handsome, handsome. She's looking at me like you're uh, whatever dad, right? And then she said, pretty, pretty mommy. And I said, yes. We've come to the end. I know, I know you will go from this place and sin will try to do something to make you forget what you learned here today. Don't let it. Listen to me close. This is my concluding thought. At times, a deep sense of our unworthiness will send a thrill of terror through your soul. But this is not evidence that God has changed toward us or we toward him. No effort should be made to rein the mind up to a certain intensity of emotion. We may not feel today the peace and joy that we felt yesterday, but we should by faith grasp the hand of Christ and trust him as fully in the darkness as we do in the light. Um, If I can ask my church family to stand with me as we sing our closing song, and I will pray after that.
Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, thank you so much uh, for sending your Son and for the gift of the Holy Spirit. As we go forth from this place, just help us to have a wonderful week. Um, Help everyone here uh, to just be blessed and to remember that they're blessed because they're together and they're together with you. We love you, Lord. In your Son's name we pray. Amen.